time for any questions. Um, I want to welcome, obviously, the University of Iowa students and re their research that they're, they're helping our community with on, on talking about this topic and our opiate um, mm -hmm. ep epidemic and problems not just in Clinton but around the country. So we, we are very happy that you were able to work with us in Clinton. I'll let them each introduce themselves and talk about their presentation, but we, uh, we I'm sure this is going to benefit our community greatly. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Jocelyn Williams. I'm Cameron Carpenter. I'm Maggie Schnur. And I'm Andrew Parr. And today we're going to be talking to you a little bit about opioids in Clinton, specifically about access stigma and how it shows up in this community. And actually, before we get in that, there's some other IISC, so Iowa Initiative for Sustainable Communities things happening today. Um, there's one after this for... So there's the Master Plan for Liberty Square. Um, that's happening in City Hall at 4 p.m. Also happening in City Hall is the Infill Development of City Property Project. And then here at 4 is the Youth Substance Abuse Prevention Group. And then we're finishing everything off at 5 o'clock at the uh, Rusty Barrel for a celebration. Yeah. yeah, so we'd be happy to see you all there. Alrighty, so first of all, we wanted to say a very warm thank you to all of our project partners. Without you guys, this project couldn't have been possible and we really leaned on your input and feedback to kind of guide our methodology and how we're going to work in the community. So specifically, we have Kristen and Mike. They were great partners. They taught us a lot about the community and then also their positions within the community and how they're already working to advocate for opioid betterment in the community. Moving on, we've got a little bit of data here about Clinton substance use. So opioid overdoses in 2022 were 19. Drug-related arrests were 73. And then of those drug-related arrests, 36 of which were meth-related. So this kind of points to a larger issue with substance use, specifically polyuse disorder. And opioids, they are a problem here, but as we learned from our project partners, not as many people are dying from them. And so we kind of tried to think of different ways that we could organize opioid use, substance use, how are they similar, how are they different, and how can we kind of combine and justify similar goals and opportunities. Also, area hospitals have seen an increase in cases specifically from 2019 to 2022 involving again that substance use disorder. All right so as a team we divided our methodology into two sections. Um, once we identified that we're focusing on OUD and SUD our first step in the methodology was really to do a deep dive into literature reviews and case studies and the goals of these literature reviews and case studies was just to develop a thorough understanding of OUD and SUD, um, not only in Iowa and in, in Clinton, but also nationally and what other communities are doing. And in this process, we discovered best practices and policies that would be very influential in our policy recommendations and further along in our studies. And one of the best practices that came up um, to be a pr really prominent uh, kind of topic was this peer recovery support services. So peer recovery support services are all about connecting people with OUD and SUD um, to people in recovery and then tailoring solutions um, to kind of help them um, on their journey to recovery. And one of the best practices that we identified actually comes from Iowa, not too far from here, is, which is Cedar Rapids. And in Cedar Rapids, there's a crush of Iowa, which is all about providing peer recovery support services to people in recovery and those with OUD and SUD. In addition to that, one of the policies we identified um, it's really a new development, which is this elimination of X waivers for buprenorphin. Uh, bupren this is really huge because it's going to expand access to people who, uh, who, really need, who really need treatment services. Um, previously, physicians, they needed this X waiver to provide um, MIT services to people. So with this elimination at the national level, this just eases access. And it was in this stage that the team identified that the barriers associated with treatment access and stigma was what we needed to focus on not only in our second part of our methodology, but also in our policy recommendations. So now jumping into our second part. So then after we identified, we developed a holistic understanding of OUD and SUD at a national scale, we really wanted to understand the problem as it relates to Clinton. So this is when we decided that the best way to do this was to talk to stakeholders in the community to realize what's being done and where there's opportunities for growth. 
Um, <laughs> so just a little bit of background on the stakeholder interviews. They took place between February 2023 of this year and then they carried out until April of 2023. They were held virtual and in person. In total, we interviewed 12 local and expert stakeholders. Um, the stakeholders we interviewed included healthcare professionals, sheriff, psychiatrists, social service professionals, correction officers, peer support professionals, and behavioral health professionals, just because we wanted to understand the wide scope of it, everybody that's interacting with um, people with OUD and SUD and what kind of interventions were happening and what kind of services were available. So we asked each of these interviews the same list of questions, and then what, as the conversation went on, we had follow-up questions, um, and then this really, jumping into our findings, so then after we uh, took our, all the information from our first and, section, first and second sections of our methodology, um, as a team we identified um, that not only, although there are problems that we identified and there's room for improvement, Clinton also has this whole slew of assets. So some of the problems that we identified were that there is this increasing demand. There's people who need services um, and treatment options for people who have OED and SUD, but the demand doesn't, the supply doesn't meet the demand. Another thing that we identified was that there's stigma among providers, in addition to other barriers to accessing treatment. And we'll get to that, we'll get into more of those details later on. And then, but we also um, identified that there are assets uh, that Clinton has that makes it really unique and it provides opportunities. Uh, three of these are that there's an interconnected professional network, there's innovation in the administrative capacity, and also Clinton's getting about 1.2 in settlement money, which um, holds a foundation for really putting some of these recommendations into practice. So speaking a little more in depth on the specific problems here, we've got increasing demand here in Clinton. Um, we know that this is for our treatment services and our programming, and unfortunately, we also know that there is not enough supply locally in this community to meet that increasing demand. Um, for example, Life Connections, thank you Amanda for coming, mm -hmm. unfortunately had to close during our project this semester. That was heartbreaking. It was hard to keep going as students who are studying this and valuing this because it's like the people in the community, they're doing it. But it's part of supply and demand. And so that needs to be outlined as a clear problem, which we have here. Also, there's not enough time on the job from different community members. They say they struggle with supplying OED and SUD services and help and assistance to people who need them when they could be doing that in their job. Like it is ancillarily related. They don't feel like they have enough time to do that. Another problem, stigma and specific barriers to accessing treatment. So we have stigma held by healthcare providers, specifically in Clinton, which creates a barrier to treatment access. And this stigma isn't unique to Clinton. This is healthcare stigma across the board, across the nation. It's one of those things that definitely reduces access, but unfortunately it's hard to combat because it's so personal and personal beliefs of addiction, right? That's hard to combat. And so we know that healthcare in Clinton has a negative reputation for accessibility for these populations seeking OUD and SUD treatment and services. And we know that stakeholders have shared the challenges associated with the novelty of addiction treatment and services. So it's all kind of a big crazy mess. We got demand increasing, supply decreasing. We've got new things popping up, new organizations trying to work together in new ways. And you're all doing an amazing job. There's so much great things happening here and it's exciting. Oh yeah, okay, moving on to assets. So we did our first two problems, now we're getting into assets. Interconnected professional network. Thank you, all of you guys. That was so easy to see when we came here. All of you guys were familiar with each other's work, familiar with what you're doing, and then also you gave us examples of how you're already working together and you're already collaborating. That's a huge asset. That's something that we want to put up on a pedestal and say, yes, keep doing this. This is, this is what's gonna make it work. This is gonna make the difference. And so these stakeholders, you guys, were always eager to provide suggestions for additional local providers to contact. And the existing network is a resource and asset which should be elevated and improved. Finally, our innovation in administrative capacity. One of my favorite conversations during this whole research was talking with the sheriff. And it was because he gave us an example of how administrative capacity was increased 
here specifically in Clinton through the Resource Center, the County Resource Center. And that was through collaboration of different people that aren't necessarily connected in ways that you think they would be. They're like, hey, we're all working on this in different ways. Let's put our knowledge together and maybe we can come up with different ideas. It works and it's improving outcomes here in Clinton. It's great, great, great job. So after, so what, after our interviews and we came together, we looked at our um, findings and we developed like these key themes where it comes to like connecting our assets to the problems. As a team, we developed these 10 recommendations. And in a way, they all hit either st stigma or access or both. Um, for this presentation, we're only gonna highlight two, which are, which is the first one, which is about implementing organizational training sessions on OUD and SUD for healthcare providers, law enforcement, and other professional organization. And the second one that we're gonna go into details about is opening a community center that provides services specifically for OUD and SUD. So the first uh, policy recommendation that we're gonna highlight is the implementation of organizational training sessions for different professional organizations. Now the goal in this is to address stigma specifically um, and to provide professionals with the knowledge and skills to not only identify, treat, but also prevent OUD and SUD within their specific organization. Now for these, since different organizations will be receiving these trainings, it's important that each of them is tailored to each organization. Each organization performs different duties, um, so all of the materials need to be tailored with that in mind. Um, another important component of these training sessions is that there needs to be a thorough understanding or presentation on understanding OUD and SUD. Um, each of these training sessions need to pr provide strategies for pre prevention and then also provide all the participants with um, screening and assessment tools for identifying individuals with OUD and SUD, in addition to connecting them with the necessary resources. Um, there also needs to be an emphasis on collaboration. Through our interviews, we saw that there's so many organizations that are working together. So it's important in these organizations, in these trainings, that we emphasize what other community organizations are doing, and then emphasize how all of these can work together um, to provide people who need the help with it. And finally, our Access Center. We're so excited because this was one of the most popular responses when we asked interview participants, if you could do anything, what would you do? So many people said, well, we've got that increasing demand, that decreasing supply. Let's implement, no, no. Let's open a, <laughs> open a community center that provides services specifically for OUD and SUD. So the goal here is to provide a supportive and welcoming environment for individuals in recovery and to offer a variety of services for those seeking help. Now, some of the things that we heard in the interviews, we were, okay, yes, we, we, we understand supply going down, demand increasing, open a center, increase access. But that's a, that's a big charge, right? And so we were asking, well, how would you do it? What would you think about? Some of the things we heard were that we would want it centrally located. Oh, <laughs> centrally located. <laughs> I'm not gonna touch it. Okay, we would want it to be centrally located because that is the area where people are struggling and where they can access it most easily. Additionally, huge emphasis on the peer recovery. It is one of the best practices, and I think personally, that's because of accountability. Like when you can get people in a room and get that stigma out of the way and see each other for who they are as humans, you're gonna go so much further. And that's what we heard throughout our interviews. Also, we're gonna do housing and organizational community resources within this place, so kind of like the Resource Center. It would be a place where you can come, figure out what else is going on in the community, other ways that you can be benefited, and have all of that there in like a one-stop shop. We would also focus on outreach and awareness events, so kind of like the stigma component of it. When you're like publicizing and saying, hey, we've got this new thing going on, that would be the perfect time to say, and this is why it's important and necessary in our community. Finally, the initial, cap the initial capital could be a lot, right? And so we were like, open a center. We just have one close. <laughs> How are you gonna, money, money, right? So unfortunately, no, not unfortunately, fortunately, we have a wonderful opioid settlement pot of money. And that big pot of money is uh, influx from 
Purdue Pharma settlements mm -hmm. that can be spent over the next 18 years, I believe, and it's portioned out per year, so you couldn't spend it all in one big lump sum. However, you could budget correctly, you could get other community input, you could write grants, and it could be feasible, it could be a realistic reality. So, super exciting. And that is it. Thank you all. Questions or any of those? Kristen, you can answer. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Dean, maybe Sergeant Ottens can talk. We talk about some of the things that are going on though in the outreach programs, but Sergeant Ottens, you had something yesterday that you had the most people. Oh, we had, we had a community outreach, you know, Mike and I do those uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. twice a month, uh, got an information referral. And yesterday it was really, it, it was neat because we had um, at least eight people come up and it wasn't the, oh, I have a friend. No, it was, uh, I know for a fact, two were straight up, I'm an addict. Oh. And, and, you know, in tears, I need help. Okay. So, I don't know if it was the weather. I don't know. It has it been was, beautiful. Yeah. But it was, it was one of the most successful outreaches we've had. Oh, my goodness. And Congratulations. It, it came out of the blue, and it really, most of it was in the last hour. It's only a two-hour event. Oh, my gosh. So. And you're doing these every, twice a month. Twice a month. And yeah. this yes. one, you didn't have food. You sometimes, we do them at the parks, and they have food. Uh -huh. And people obviously they just come for the food and talk. That's you never know when you're going to make a contact. But yeah. but Dean is, uh, I mean, it's, it's you never know which day you're going to uh, have a good contact. And that's through and Dart. Show up, so. Yeah, that's with, with, with me and Mike. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 awesome. And that's Mike would be here. That's but with uh, ASAC. Yeah. Also was there, and uh, yeah, so a lot of times the fire department comes over and. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, that's amazing. It was a good day. Yes, that's so great to hear. Thank you for telling us. That's what we want. <laughs> that's what's been so amazing about this project is how so many of our recommendations have come just as straight echoes from what we've heard from the community. Like, obviously, you guys have already been working on this much longer than we have. So it's nice to see you guys all united in this. And it's been nice to, like, have that as, like, our backing. It made us very confident in what we were doing. Yeah, couldn't have been here without all you guys. <laughs> yeah, quite truly. Yeah. So through this project, what, how has it opened? You guys are obviously young adults, <laughs> University of Iowa. How has it opened your eyes on this problem, not just in Clinton, but did you know about it before you started digging into this? Or has it really opened your eyes and said, hey, this is? I think, I think like we initially, because we kind of started work on this uh, last semester, just as kind of introductory. And so we learned about how, it, how the opioid epidemic is occurring nationally. Um, and we kind of quickly realized that you know, Clinton, it's gonna be different here. Um, one interesting thing that was just in, like very uh, apparent is that there's a lot of money out there for opioids, um, but I think interest is waning. I think people's uh, attention are going towards other, just other events um, and problems that we have in our society nationally. So I'm, I'm thinking like one thing that we're kind of expecting is that this funding might start to kind of disappear over time, not, you know, not all at once, but we, you know, we just see that there's a little bit less interest. And I think policymakers nationally might think that we've done, we've done a lot so far and, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're kind of done and we can move on. So I think one, one thing is just to keep the, the urgency of this problem apparent uh, to the public and to policymakers so that we know that there's still more work to do. So for me, my family has struggled with mental health, and I wasn't surprised to hear about the comorbidity of mental health and addiction, but it didn't make me feel good, and I see it even in my own family. And this project personally was hard because so many of the barriers that the people here in Clinton are struggling with are the same barriers that people using drugs across the state of Iowa are facing. It's not just here. And like you said, sometimes it's a family member and that's how you learn about it. And other times you're assigned and that's how you learn about it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that everybody is learning about it and caring about it and working towards improving it, that's where I'm excited to work on it. I see in your, uh, you say numbers, uh, seven, like uh, create inner city bus routes, expand access to services in Davenport. That kind of leads me to believe you've maybe looked at other communities to compare them. Have you looked at other like-sized communities to Clinton to see, you know, like 
the statistics compared to statistics, what we offer compared to a like size community, anything like that, any other comparables that you factored in? Yeah. Yeah. What did um, you find or what was your So you it's recall? something that we talked a lot about with our faculty is like looking at it from just the number standpoint, what's happening in Clinton is not isolated. Um, it's pretty much the same rate as across the state of Iowa. I think what makes Clinton so unique is like how much you guys as a community care about this. Like uh, Andrew said before, the urgency seems to be fading other places, but you guys are pretty unified in like wanting to fight this. And it really gives us a clear window of like, we call it policy windows, the ability to push things through when everyone's united on the same front, which that's what makes Clinton different. I think on like the other side of other statistics and things being open, I think it was truly a travesty, Life Connections, that branch that dealt with this closed down. Because if um, another one we talked about was Crush in um, Cedar Rapids. Cedar Rapids just has a really good human resources community there that um, is really hard to emulate in other places. They also got the grant too. Right? Yeah, they also have a grant yeah. for their resource center there, which is something that we talk about in our um, Report. Report, thank yes. you, about uh, you guys accessing, but it's just, there's a lot of things that you could say, oh, maybe we're not up to snuff, but I think the people in this room showing up, all the things that you guys have done that has made this possible already shows just how strong Clinton is as a community to face this. I think that's what makes you different. Maybe not the statistics, maybe not that it's worse here than other places, but the, you, you guys care, and that's what matters. Um, and looking at kind of specifically the transportation factor, because um, we know that there's not enough services in Clinton, but we know that there's you know available uh, treatment services in, in Davenport, um, and we know that there's been some efforts uh, by the sheriff to, to transport people there. Um, we didn't find necessarily um, an intercity bus route in another community, between two other communities in Iowa, um, but we wanted to include this in our recommendations just because we know that one of the best uh, options moving forward might be to utilize those services in a nearby community. Um, we didn't, we weren't able to focus a lot of efforts on like how exactly would you create this inner city bus route because uh, we learned very quickly that it's very complicated to get one of those going. Um, it also, you know, has to do with like we need drivers, we need the bus, like there's just Insurance. a lot of elements, but uh, we wanted to include it in our list just to make sure that it was known that if that existed that would be an, an insane help to the community well and you can also kind of think as, of these recommendations as like opportunities and you can think of your problems as the confines you can think of your assets as what's going to get you where you want to go as long as you have that vision you guys have everything that you need to get whatever you want done and i will say and that's exciting city, oh, so sorry I will say the inner city bus route came after uh, several emails between me and a worker at the Iowa DOT about making a private fleet, but the liability of a private fleet for anyone is so high. Yeah. They're like, here's this grant. Please stop emailing me like five times a day <laughs> about this. Here you go. <laughs> so it was after I annoyed a DOT worker enough to get us this. <laughs> yeah. And ideally, a recovery community server ser uh, center would have a recovery bus or a recovery van that would provide transportation to places. Like you would come in to get services, you would get a referral, and we would provide that transportation to a detox location or to a treatment inpatient treatment facility. Or even something as simple as when you have a peer-led recovery meeting that people have a transportation barrier, you would do a, a route through town and you would pick these people up. So in, in an ideal recovery community center, that stuff wouldn't become a barrier if, if we do it correctly. Yeah. And that's our hope with like the recovery um, center is like all of these are supposed to be like stepping stones to get there. Since that big large capital project might take a while or it might have some opposition because of nimbyism or budgetary constraints. budgetary constraints. So finding ways to try to disseminate these services before that's created, to have these services already present so when there's finally a place to house them, they can be housed and they're already all there, is kind of what we're looking at here. So we're hoping that some of these become obsolete with the creation of that center, you know? Yeah. Can you expand on number six? What is the uh, mental health programming through Iowa Community Mental Health Services? What is that? 
So the Iowa Community Mental Health Services Block Grant is a federal grant that the state of Iowa gets. It's 5.5 million a year. And it's used for anything mental health related, which includes uh, comorbidity from mental health, mental illness and addiction and just peer addiction services. From what I've seen, most people use it for youth mental health programming, but it's any services um, that can be fit into the mental health arm and it's to expand uh, services. So looking at this is kind of into expanding what's already here and implementing things that are already work here. So looking at uh, the community mental health center here is Bridgeview, so allowing Bridgeview to get some of this money to help them expand the services they already have in mental health, or maybe if the community does this themselves, they find a better place for this. And um, through our report, we actually, I went through the whole grant myself and wrote down everything you need for it. And the state of Iowa actually did most of it for you. Most of it's already filled out. So all you have to do is show them your goals, your benchmarks, and where you're gonna allocate the money. And then that's the entire grant process. So it's a really, I don't wanna say easy pot of money because that's still a lot of work, but it's a pot of money that's available to the community. Because something we thought about making this is we don't wanna be completely tied to the settlement money. We want there to be stable sources of income elsewhere. Can I jump on that? So the, the sheriff asked about number seven, uh, trying to do a bus route to Davenport. Um, who in Davenport are you suggesting that you would have a bus route going to for the treatment center? Well, which, it which be one? Direct. Are you talking about Vera no. Fresh or are you talking about what treatment center down there? So it's just to access those treatment centers. So the inner city bus route wouldn't be able to go directly to treatment centers. It would just get you to the bus uh, hub in Davenport. Uh, when I talk to them, the reason you need it is it has to be connected to another Burlington Trailways like hub. So that's the only reason that bus would work. So it'd be kind of just connecting Clinton to Davenport itself so anyone who wanted to use it could. We're just looking at all access and how much access can be expanded through this. So it wouldn't be specifically for treatment. It'd just be a bus route. Okay. Right now we do have ways to get people out to Davenport mm -hmm. for things like detox or treatment. Um, you know, sometimes mobile crisis will help out. Uh, and there is uh, Riverbend Transit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys probably already looked into that too. Uh, I think one of the bigger uh, barriers to that would be when, when somebody comes in and they reach that brief window in time where they're ready for help, mm -hmm. like right now. Right now, the big barrier is that it, we can call, you know, say mobile crisis. It takes them over an hour to get there, and they're just sitting in one spot or, you know, withdrawing right, right then and there in front of you. So that's been that's been a big barrier. So if there was uh, something, an inner city uh, bus route, I would hope it would have like a scheduled time that it would be in, mm -hmm. and not just like willy mm -hmm. nilly. Yeah. It's huge. And we, you've told us this before, so we really tried thinking about how important it was to connect to Davenport, but how important it is to get services back here. That's what matters most. Yeah. So, so everybody in the mental health region, which is Jackson, Clinton, Scott, mm -hmm. Constantine counties, and Sierra County, all have difficulty getting service providers to come to our area. Right? I mean, they, very few graduating with this type of training so trying to lure them here is very difficult and then and then to try to get them to Clinton is even more difficult than trying to get them to Davenport uh, per se you know so if they had the choice in Iowa and they're gonna go to Polk County you're gonna go to Cedar County uh, Johnson County or they're gonna go to Lynn County or go to Scott County I mean that's that's the poll um, that's our biggest thing so our mental health region has uh, I'm not gonna say excess money, but we have money that we have not spent on services because there's no providers that are available to provide the services. Mm -hmm. um, Bridgeview, our local you know, community mental health center, has been short you know, service providers for, for years now. They can't get them to come. I mean, they could use two or three today. They yeah. just cannot get them hired. So, yeah. Well, and when we were looking, because we did think about that, how the rural location of Clinton 
kind of affects its opportunities to grow and to meet these needs. And we were looking into things like the city already incentivizing people to move here by paying back student loan debt. And I think I would move, I mean, I'm moving back to a similarly sized community just in a couple of weeks, Burlington. So I think the things that are going to pull people and bring people are those kinds of things, creating incentives, but also relying on your community, building the community, building up family bonds so that kids want to come back, and they will. I can also speak to that because I am a mental health provider and live here in Clinton. And do you work here? Yes, I do. Also live here and I work here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the environment makes a huge difference, right? The work environment, the caseloads, the expectations, right? And so if we are in a provider desert, then you have, like, I've worked at a job where I'm working 60 hours a week, and it does not pay well either. And so if you don't have a passion for it, right, then what's the incentive if you are not making money and you're overworking yourself to the point of burnout, right? And a lot of that has to do with the culture of the environment that you're working in. And so I think that's an important thing, too. If, if you want to get people to move to Clinton, right, because this is a great town. I love this town, right? If you want to get people to move here, then you have to facilitate an environment where people want to work, not just a community. That's hard to do, but you guys are already on this, that trajectory. You're already taking those steps. We already see it, and it's exciting. I mean, I'm sure. I hope they're all sure. <laughs> you guys are going to see some success. If not soon, then down the line. You've got assets and opportunities coming in, and you're all thinking together. It's exciting. That Purdue Pharma was $1.2 million, but you have to spend that out over 18 years. Yeah, so we have a slide about that. 66000 a year? Okay. Yeah. And so is that for the nation or just this region? Just, just this region. Clinton just Clinton, Clinton County. County. Yeah. yeah, Clinton County. So this is the entire payout of Clinton County. So you have Macklinrot, they made some drugs. They have to pay that much in just one year, only 8000 Then you have Janssen, they're another creator, like a manufacturer. They pay out over um, from 2023 to 2032. And then you have... Um, and that's the 11 year one. And then you have the 18 year one, which is the distributors of all the opioids, and they pay out until 20, uh, well, 18 years. So, 2039. So, it's been a, we, we, this was such a complicated thing. I feel like we all looked at it, studied it, and went, oh, I hope to never see this again. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, the county has actually already gotten a substantial sum of this money mm -hmm. front loaded. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've decided to do is we're sending three. Three or four individuals to a, a conference in Des Moines to learn more about um, how to get the biggest bang for your buck, basically, on where these these funds should go. Um, so at, at this point in time, the county's in a holding pattern until we have people that actually work in this area go out and learn more, and then come back and advise us mm -hmm. on how it should be spent. <laughs> it's nice to hear that it's front loaded because yes. we actually discussed this with one of our professors and found out the reason it's over 18 years is because uh, basically the people who did this uh, can pay it all in tax rebate and then so they don't actually lose the money uh, a cent from their own pocket for it, which is really front disheartening front. when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you think about how we tax the people who <laughs> But yeah, like the first couple payments of this are already like 90000 right? So, not including Jansen as well. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what was, what was the name of that conference? In Des Moines? What conference? The conference. Oh, oh um, it's in Des Moines, uh, May 24th and 25th. Ooh, coming up. I'll check in. Thank yeah. you. It's very, very specific on how the funds can be used. And oh, okay. yeah. Use gotcha. Salary. Yeah, you can't pay salary. So, like I said, we, we don't want to do anything with it or say we're going to do anything with it until we, we find out more about the program and we send people to get educated mm -hmm. about best ways to use it. Okay. Yeah, we, we felt the constraints of that too, making some of these. And I'm sure we broke some of the rules as well. Just because they, uh, the Iowa State Auditor site has one paragraph 
and that's all I could find on the constraints of it. So that was really fun. So it's, it's really great nice. that they're having this. Yeah, it's yeah. really it's nice that they're trying to import it. I think it's because there was a, a lot of questions. Yeah, they, like they would send out emails, you could spend the money on this, and then another one would come and say something else. And uh -huh. so. Um, sounds like bureaucracy. Yeah, no, it sounds like they're trying to correct the mistake, though. Mm -hmm. It's good. That's okay. exciting. Any other questions before we wrap it up for you guys? We can go back to that list of recommendations. And of course, if anyone wants to report, we will send it to literally anyone it's uh, once it's wrong. completely finished. Mm -hmm. And it will be up on the website. Mm -hmm. And it will be on, up on the ISC website. So for the training sessions for healthcare providers, law enforcement, I mean, would they have to volunteer for that? Or would it be like presented to them, like Here's, here are these resources? Or would it be like, you know, to be a partner, you have to take this training? or? I think our vision is that it would be more voluntary um, and it would be you know it we just know that it, through our co-leads that addiction training can make a real difference in the perspective of someone especially if they are working directly with um, people who have addiction so like Mike our co-lead he he told us about how you know before he uh, did addiction training he had very negative views of, of people with opioid use disorder and you know kind of uh, had that stigma that kind of that what people sort of think of uh, like saying the word addicts like we he his whole sort of worldview was changed through this training so that was one reason that we wanted to include it in the recommendations because we know that it can make a world of difference in just how someone thinks about it and if it is people who are in uh, health provider roles mental health any kind of interaction directly with people who have addiction, it can make a huge difference on how they treat that person, uh, how they view the potential of that person, and their motivation for getting that person to help. And none of that might be there if they don't, if they don't kind of go through that training. Yes, also building on Amanda's point about culture, I think you, you can't say, take this addiction training and change your mind about how you feel about addiction. You, you can, but there's no guarantee that they will. And so I think it get, gets back to the culture of the work environment, the organizational culture, the people that are stepping up into leadership positions and saying, hey, this is our organization. I am a leader here. If you want to get to my position one day, this is what's expected of you. And just being very clear from the get-go and understanding that you have the support from the wide variety of network connections here locally to be able to enforce and live by those standards. And I think that will naturally help increase some of that. And that is so true. I mean, we, we've talked about it in some of our meetings where, you know, if, if you, you police department, a, um, a hospital, the fire department, if you have the leader up here, like, you yep. know, the shift sergeant, and I sit there and I say, I don't have time for those people, the addicts. They see I, that. New people come mm -hmm. in, they see that, they hear that, guess what? They don't either. Yeah, why would so they? So if we train our leaders to go ahead and change their mindsets and have them buy in, and we, we, we change it there, that's where we start making this yes. change. And like I said, you can you can take the fire department, you go to the hospital, don't think that the nurses don't get burned out. When you're mm -hmm. the charge nurse for 10 years in the ER and people are coming in, they're going, hey, I just want my, give yeah. me my fix. That was one they of our interviewees. Yeah. Yeah. So we, that's where we need to make those changes. Absolutely. You know, and we heard that from the work. wide variety, the gamut of our interview participants. Mm -hmm. And so that's an easy question. And the training is ongoing for us in law enforcement. Like Ken Sarkis said, it's a lot of young officers, people come and think it's the same thing. They made their bed, they sleep in it, whatever it may be, but it's not that easy. It's, it, they don't have a choice in, in making sure, you know, it's, it's not a can't change that part of it. So we, we try to teach, we have a lot of ongoing in-department training. So you asked about training and who, we, we, it's just part of our, our training that we put our officers through in law enforcement. So to try to understand it better, you know, and, and have good leaders to, to show them the right way yeah. to do it. Absolutely. And it's easy to live a sheltered life in Small Town, Iowa, coming from a small town myself. So how are you supposed to know about it unless someone tries to tell you or you learn on your own? So trying to take the burden off of people who have suffered from addiction or from the people who always interact with it, trying to teach everyone about it, because it's not on them to teach everyone as well, right? We need to make, like, hold these people accountable to know what's happening, which I love that you guys are already doing that. Again, shows how great this is going to be. 
we'll just say, I can say one thing as a side note for number two those are they're already available in our community training mm -hmm. so uh -huh. if you're like we really like to have that we have a team of experts in our community it could step up and do that from like an informal talk to like a formal presentation so i'm not saying this like me but there's a team right of people that can do this sort of thing and then our office is uh, i know looking at as clint substance abuse council we're going through the strategic prevention framework which is basically a community planning model to determine the ability to have a resource center here so assessment what's the need building capacity creating a plan for that um through that process now yeah instead of just saying we're going to open it tomorrow which would be what everybody would love but that's not <laughs> what <it laughs> happened you know or do what we needed to do so what does this need to look like what pieces need to be in place yeah. for this to happen exactly so we can really be thought out because that's kind of our role in the community is to make that community plan mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. how does everybody fit how can we so all these things and absolutely yeah. use her use that resource yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was our hope is that we could just help anything you guys yeah. already do absolutely as well. good job thank you Perfect. yeah great job i'd like to thank you from the clinton police department um, obviously you spoke with a lot of leaders in town uh, but your hard work and the university of iowa for letting you do this for us and, and trying to help our community and not just ours extends through across the iowa but um, and the leaders that are here that support what you're doing so thank all of you for doing that Great job, great presentation. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you so much. Thank you all for having us.